Okay, let's get started with section three of chapter 26. In this section, we're going to talk about um, a little bit of the theory behind how we model and think about growth as economists. So the first thing we need to talk about is something called the production function. The production function is a mathematical representation of a economy's technology. In other words, you take this production function, it's a mathematical equation where you say, okay, tell me how much, say, labor we have, how much capital we have, how much natural resources we have. We take the inputs, and then it tells us how much output we can get. And not just any output, but the maximal output that we can um, produce given that set of labor and our current technological processes. Growth is, in essence, a shifting of the production function. It's moving the production function up. In other words, technological growth comes from being able to produce more with less. A uh, classical growth model is a model of growth that focuses on the role of capital accumulation um, in the growth process. So as we accumulate more capital, we have more tools, more factories, more stuff to make stuff, and therefore we can make more stuff. According to the classical growth model, the more capital an economy has, the faster it will grow. Um, classical economists focus their analysis on the policy advice on how to increase investment because savings leads to growth. Okay, so let's, let's back up here for a minute. Essentially, the classical growth model says the higher your savings rate, the more output per worker you're going to have. Okay? And the savings rate drives investment because, if you remember in the previous section, we talked about that loanable funds framework. Where does the um, funding for investment come from? It comes from savings. So businesses borrow money on this loanable funds market. All right, and savers lend money on that loanable funds market. And the more savings we have, the lower interest rates become because we have an increased supply lowering the price of money, which, and that's all interest rate is, is the rental price of money. And then if we um, lower that interest rate, we make other investments like, say, a factory look better because you can make more money because you have to spend less on interest. So basic idea is savings leads to investment, which leads to increased capital, which leads to growth. So diminishing returns and population growth. Okay, so well, one of the things that we have to run into, though, is this idea of diminishing returns. So let's start out. Diminishing marginal productivity of labor causes per capita income to decline as labor supply increases. In other words, Let's, let's think of it like this. Let's say we have a coffee shop. All right, and this is a very micro kind of thing to think about. But let's say we hire one person at this coffee shop. All right, and it's a fully stocked coffee shop. It's got a four-pull espresso maker. It's got good coffee grinders. It's got all the stuff you need to make uh, a well-run coffee shop. And we hire one person. And we have a line 10 miles long out, out the door because this one person just can't keep up. So we hire two people. Now, two people not only can produce, but they can produce more than twice what one person can do because, well, one person runs the cash register, one person runs making the coffee. I mean, you can split things up and be more specialized, and you're just much more productive. But let's say we had three people. Well, maybe we're as productive as, you know, we're going to be almost three times as productive. Four people, five people. By the time we get to adding, like, say, 30 people behind the counter, they're all squished in there so tight they can't move, and, well, nothing happens, right? Well, there's diminishing returns to any input. So as we increase an input beyond a certain level, we find that, well, more isn't necessarily better. All right. So as output per person declines, at some point, we hit this point here, um, where output is no longer sufficient to feed population. So if we have more and more and more people, at some point we get to the point where we cannot produce enough stuff to feed all the people, right? Because of this idea of diminishing marginal product of labor. Now this is uh, a very what we call Malthusian type 
thinking. Sir Robert Thomas Malthus always thought that, or his theory was that there would always be starvation in the world because world population would tend to grow faster, would have a tendency to grow faster. It wouldn't grow faster because it was limited by how much people could eat um, than food production. Well, so the real question then becomes, where is this L star point, all right? And where is this point that, well, we can't support the population anymore? Um, it is a good question. Um, what, what has happened is the um, Malthusian line says, wait a minute, it's way back here. But it turns out that that didn't hold up very well because we had technological improvements. So as we have technological progress, it pushes this L star farther and farther and farther out. Now, the question today is, when we talk about, say, sustainability and sustainable growth, is how much farther can technology push this break-even point, where if our population goes beyond, we can no longer feed them? Yeah, that's a good question. So, diminishing marginal product of capital, also, we have... Um, uh, this productivity of capital will diminish over time or over over quantities. If we just add more and more and more capital, we can go back to our our coffee shop example. Let's say we have two employees and we add two registers, so we can have two lines and two coffee machines, so we can have two lines simultaneously. That sounds pretty good. But what happens if we added three? So three registers, three lines, um, three coffee machines, but we only have two people. Well, that third one isn't going to get used very much because right, we don't have a person to be there. So you can see as we add more and more capital, well, the amount of additional output that comes from that next unit of capital is going to be less. So the focus has become on the, on the law of diminishing marginal productivity of capital, not on labor. Well, one of the reasons why we don't worry about labor so much is because if we look at the developed world, um, the populations of the developed world are either stable or diminishing. Um, if we looked at the underdeveloped world, so the third world, the developing countries and the underdeveloped countries, their population seems to be growing. Um, but if we look at the rich cap countries of the world, all right, so the so-called G20, I mean, we've got these uh, upper echelon countries like the United States, um, the European countries, Canada, a few, of other, a few other countries in there. Um, Japan, we see the populations are pretty well stable. In fact, in the United States, we actually almost are a little worried about it going the other way, the population declining as the baby boom generation um, basically ages out. Um, so we're more worried about overcapitalizing. All right, as capital grew faster than labor, capital would become less productive and lead to slower and slower growth. Eventually, per capita growth would stagnate. Um, and, and this is this basic idea that at some point we come to some kind of a steady state. All right, and I don't want to go into this too much because that's intermediate macro. I don't want to talk about the dynamics of this model too much because it just gets too much math for a principles class. But essentially we come up to some point where things are stable. All of the forces are kind of in balance with one another. And so we kind of truck along like that. Uh, and that's what we talk about this this per capita growth rate stabilizing. So if that's the truth, if we have this minute diminishing marginal product of capital, we have diminishing marginal product of labor, right? Um, sorry, I didn't mean to flip too fast there, but that's okay. Um, eventually, we should come up to some what we'll call a steady state level of um, output per worker or output per person then shouldn't other countries, well, grow up to that point, and shouldn't we all converge to the same output per worker? And, and the idea behind this is simple. If pr the, the law of diminishing return or, or diminishing marginal product of capital um, kicks in, shouldn't some country that has a very small amount of capital have a much higher return for investing in capital there than, say, investing in capital in the United States. So a, a great example of this would be a highway system. All right, We can invest in a brand new interstate highway system in the United States. Or we can invest in a brand new intercontinental interstate highway system in Africa, which would yield higher returns. Well, 
if we invest in a new one in the United States, we'd be replacing one that we already have. Now, granted, there are there's lots of places where it need, our highway system can be improved, but essentially we have one. If you look at a lot of Africa, they don't have one at all. And so it would be, instead of going from a adequate one to a better one, it would be going from none to something, which is a much bigger jump in Africa than it would be in the United States. Therefore, if we're going to figure out where we're going to get the most bang for our buck, we would say, well, shouldn't we build roads in Africa? Well, okay, so it doesn't quite work that way, but that's the, sen the essential idea behind this, that the return to, to investment should be much higher in countries that are underdeveloped with low amounts of capital than in countries that are developed that are near their steady state. And that's this idea behind convergence that because that return is so much higher in these underdeveloped countries more investment goes there so they gild up more capital so they grow faster and they end up all converging to the same steady state so the convergence hypothesis is the hypothesis that per capita income in countries with similar institutional structures will converge towards the same level of income per person and i would like to add that that's actually what we call conditional convergence um, conditional convergence says that all things being equal, countries will converge to the same steady state level of output per person. So the idea is the U.S. will grow slower than developing countries because marginal product of capital is higher in developing countries. Yeah, just like what we talked about. The difference causes capital investment flows and production to move from the U.S. to developing countries and it stimulates growth. Well yes and no so let's talk about that in just a second um, as of today predictions of what we'll call absolute convergence have not happened all right that that is that just all countries and all economies will converge to the same point and that's clearly not happening in fact we see countries who've been permanently poorer than other countries all right they stay we call those the underdeveloped countries so we have basically three rough categorization of economies. Developed economies, like the US, um, developing economies, economies that are less well off than the US, or it might be considerably poorer than the US, all right, uh, we would consider them underdeveloped, but they are getting better. All right, so they're instituting institutions that have caused them to help them grow. Uh, a good example of this might be Brazil. Brazil has done a lot of work to uh, improve their economic institutions and it's caused a lot of good things to happen in their economy. Um, and then we have the underdeveloped countries, all right, the underdeveloped economies. Underdeveloped economies are economies that are poor and are permanently poor because they don't have the proper institutions to promote growth. All right, first one that comes to my mind might be Myanmar. Um, another one might be North Korea. These are underdeveloped countries, underdeveloped economies that don't have the proper institutions and have no um, prospect of having those reforms being put in place. Um, those underdeveloped countries, all right, they don't converge to the developed countries. All right, the developing ones, it looks like they're starting to, right? But the underdeveloped ones, just they just don't. All right, they just have a permanently lower output per person. Um, and that's what we call absolute convergence when we say that every country should converge to the same point. But if we take into account some, some explanations for this, um, there, there are some issues, lack of factor mobility. So like, for example, North Korea, people can't just leave North Korea. Differing institutional structures. Does the country have the kind of growth-friendly institutions that are needed to foster growth? All right. Uh, let's take some of the sub-Saharan African countries. One of the problems there is property rights. If I build a factory there, and a year later the um, government decides, "Who we like that factory, we're going to nationalize it." Well, if that's a major risk, if I don't have assurance that my property will be protected. Uh, then I run into the problem, why do I want to invest there in the first place? It's too great a risk. Um, incompatible factors of production, so um, access to resources are very important. Um, and technological agglomeration effects, uh, you know, technology is a really, really important thing. We're seeing um, a huge technology gap in 
um, certain underdeveloped countries that um, really inhibits the ability to um, grow and converge to the uh, um, more developed economies level. Uh, so basically we can divide this convergence debate into two. Absolute convergence says everybody just grows up to be the same and that's just patently false. Then we can have a little more nuanced view which we call um, conditional convergence and that is all other things being equal. All the initial conditions being equal, the economies will converge. And we see that amongst developed nations, they've converged pretty much to the same point. If you look at the underdeveloped nations, they kind of converge to a very, very low point. Um, so controlling for those factors, we do see conditional convergence. But the, the problem is, how do we take those countries that are permanently stuck in that underdeveloped state and help them um, get into at least the developing state. Um, and that's a major question in um, growth theory.